Recently, we have seen the U.S. Secretary of Transportation and also President Biden uh, saying that America cannot tolerate falling behind China. Uh, in the instance of Pete Buttigieg, he was talking about uh, the train travel in the U.S. in comparison with China. So, uh, is America first uh, really some kind of a fundamental law of nature in the U.S. and the U.S. can never fathom a world where it is number two? Well, I think the, the phrase America first, which President Trump used, is a mistaken way of defining the national interest. Uh, every country protects its national interest. China protects its national interest. The question is not whether you protect it or not, but how do you define it? You can define your national interest very narrowly, as President Trump did, mm. and you can define it quite broadly. For example, uh, if you look back to the period of uh, President Truman, President Truman uh, supported a Marshall Plan in which the United States uh, spent about 2% of its gross domestic product helping the recovery of Europe. That was obviously in American self-interest, but it was also in Europe's self-interest. So rather than defining the self-interest as insisting that Europe repay all its loans to the United States, he instead defined it as a way in which the Americans helped Europe to recover. That's Both of those are cases of protecting your own national interest, but one in a narrow way and the other in a broad way. Hmm. And I think that that's the key question that we have to get Americans to understand, as well as to get Chinese to understand, mm. that if we define our national interest broadly, not narrowly, then there's a, a brand, an area for cooperation between the countries. I think that somebody like Biden understands this. Uh, many people are asking, can Americans live with the fact that China might overtake the U.S. in some technological fields? Uh, but, of course, China is still far behind the U.S. in many uh, uh, technologies. But will it be possible if someday China overtakes the U.S. in certain technologies, Americans can accept that? Oh, I think absolutely. It's, it's already the case. I mean, when I visit China and I take the, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, fast-speed rail, I wish the Americans had something as good as that. There's a case where Chinese already are technologically ahead of the U.S. So yes, there are bound to be areas um, which are uh, in which China will be ahead of the U.S., just as there are others where the U.S. will be ahead of China. The, the tension will arise when it relates to uh, technologies which are very close to the tied to security and particularly military security mm. and that's where fear enters the equation later this year uh the nation is going to celebrate a hundredth uh, anniversary of the chinese communist party uh so while reviewing its past 100 years of history what do you think uh the chinese communist party has brought to china and the rest of the world well, if you look at uh, China's uh, uh, performance over the last uh, 40 years, uh, it's really quite remarkable. China has, has uh, raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Certainly since Deng Xiaoping, the, the policies which have been followed providing a political stability, which has been uh, accompanied by rapid economic growth, that's uh, good for China, that's good for the world. Many Chinese here wonder, uh, what kind of China does the U.S. want to see and does the U.S. want to work with? Uh, what kind of compromises uh, does the U.S. expect from China, ideally and practically? What do you well, think? I think, yeah, I think the, the way President Clinton put it uh, when he answered the question about that, remains true today. Um, a prosperous and strong China uh, is, is better for us than a weak and fragmented China. And in that sense, uh, that remains the same. In addition, I think the phrase used by Deputy Secretary of State uh, Bob Zelik in the Bush administration, 
seeing China become a responsible stakeholder uh, to help to uh, produce po global public goods. I think that remains a, a, a major objective. But I think in addition to that, we're going to have to see a, a period of compromise and understanding of each other's aspirations. We're not always going to agree. We're going to be rivals. We're going to have, be competitors. But we have to be cooperative rivals. And the greatest failure would be what I call the 1914 syndrome, mm. the sleepwalker syndrome, in which by taking risks and miscalculating, we destroy the whole system, which means that we're both far worse off. So I think those are the objectives we have.